presentation. True? Yeah, that's good. Very good. Um, I would like to share with you a view on the future of remote working from an EA's perspective. I will start by saying these are basically my own views. They're not necessarily representative of either my colleagues, my boss, or, or my company. These are just uh, views and thoughts, really. On January 27th, uh, 2014, a major incident happened in space. What happened was that a corporation called Havoc neglected to pay the lease on a system called BR5RB. This was a critical mistake on this corporation's behalf because they used it as a staging area for a massive ongoing war. Their opponents inside in this war was, were called the Pandemic Legion and they immediately swept in and started to capture the system, forcing Havoc to respond to defend it because whoever could capture it would hold it. Now this was to be known as the bloodbath of BR5RB. And as I mentioned, this took place in 2014. It took place uh, five years ago. And what happened was that over the next 21 hours, there was a constant battle in this solar system for supremacy. More than 7,000 real people were involved in this combat action. These 7,000 people were distributed among what are known as 717 different corporations. And there were more than 2,000 people simultaneously working towards a common goal on two sides. Now, all of this took place in a game called EVE Online. And just so you understand the scope of this, if you're not aware of what EVE Online is, uh, in EVE Online, you have assets, you have spaceships, and these spaceships have a real monetary value because you can use your real money to transfer into the game and use them to buy assets. But when an asset is destroyed, it is lost. It does not respawn. This means that the, the reason it is called a bloodbath is because the total financial cost of this was over $300,000 of actual converted money. So why start with this? Well, EVE Online is, as I mentioned, an online game which has existed since uh, about 2003 where they launched. They have about 35,000 to 65,000 concurrent users who perform tasks in space. Which tasks? Well, you create corporations that are very, very similar to real world businesses. Because when you create your character and you get into your first spaceship, you can decide whether you want to be a miner, a researcher, a manufacturer, a discoverer, or a pirate, or whatever. So when you create these corporations, you create them similar to real world organizational structures. You will have R&D departments, you will have manufacturing departments, et cetera, et cetera. You'll have strategies and goals. As in the example above, the goal of maintaining a section of space, a supremacy over a section of space. Now, these people have never been physically present with each other. Well, to some extent, some of them do meet, uh, but they're n they run their operations day to day basis. And they do this every day, and they have done this since 2003. They have basically done what we were forced to do in March. So how did they do that? Well, let's take a look at how our corporations work, and I'll use the one I'm a part of as the first example. Novozymes is a biotech company. We uh, research and manufacture uh, enzymes for a variety of different purposes. I've given some examples here. We will manufacture enzymes to use in agricultural feed, to help in baking industry, to help in uh, laundry detergent, to improve uh, dirt removal or stain removal or removal of smells as it were. So because we have such a wide scope of um, products, we also have a wide variety of people working in our organization. Again, we have research and development, we have manufacturing, we have um, HR and all the other things that, you know, pretty much every corporation has. So we are in many ways similar to the example above of an, a virtual organization online. We're located in different locations. Novozymes has offices in, uh, in China, in India, in the United States, in Denmark. 
Um, and since COVID-19, obviously we have many, many, many different locations as we've all been working from home. Uh, the all, we're also, all of us, whether we're a corporation in real life or a virtual one, we're, we're, we're a subject to a common set of basic requirements. There are systems in place that we have to use in order to communicate. I cannot randomly choose what software to use to communicate with my colleagues because I have a set of requirements that I have to adhere to. But we also have the same overarching need for coordination and teamwork across organizational boundaries. And so within the team, but also within business units, uh, across to supporting functions and all those things. And then there are the differences that might not be so different post COVID-19. First of which is if you look at a computer game and you take a thousand people and say to them, Let work, let's work together, they will have very disparate setups. They will be set up differently. They'll have different tools, different needs. Whereas corporately speaking, we would probably all have the same computer or the same mouse or whatever the case may be, we'll have the same software. And maybe we'll have varied needs. But post COVID, we do have that. There's a vast difference. I am standing right now at my Ray, you know, my raised desk at home because I have a raised desk. Some of my colleagues probably don't have that. So we have different needs and we have different opportunities. So when we're working remote going forward, we have to solve two problems when we're looking at it. And the first of those is how do we solve remote working for the individual? Because if we, the individual has suddenly taken a much greater uh, has become center stage for this, whereas before we would solve for the organization or the team, we're now having to solve for the individual as well as the team. But working from anywhere is not new. Um, I would venture a guess that everyone currently listening to this or is watching this has, to some extent, experienced a mobile device that they use for work answering emails, sending emails, maybe checking on an IoT device or registering a certain incident uh, while um, at an off-site location, for perhaps, or a variety of other things. So we already work from anywhere, and mobile devices drove the first change to work really, truly from anywhere. But can you imagine working only from your phone? I can't, I don't think I'd want to. Well, and then again, maybe I would because what would it take for me to be able to do that? What would it actually require for me as a, an enterprise architect to solve for in order to make that possible? And would that help? Those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves if we want to continue working from anywhere going forward. Now, working from anywhere has meant that the physical workspace is now, now a very fluid concept. We're no longer limited to having a defined physical environment in which uh, the team works or the, the individuals within the team work. Some of these situations are uh, semi-temporary uh, or semi-permanent, as it were. Some of us want to go back to work. Some of us may not want to. Some of us may have to. But how can we solve, as enterprise architects, the problems of the individual having different locations to work in? Now, the obvious example is that sometimes you need to create a very temporary solution. Um, this particular example is a cardboard desk that is made by a company called Sticka. Um, so this example is basically a, so a solution to a temporary problem. How can we work from anywhere if anywhere doesn't have a desk? As enterprise architects, we're probably more interested in other physical aspects, but this is a good example because you can solve this particular problem with a temporary cardboard desk, or you can solve it with an IKEA desk. They might cost the same, but the IKEA desk is more permanent. Which is right for you, which is right for the individual, which is right for the organization. The sticker, though, shows how a company can also use a rapid disruption such as the COVID-19 uh, to, to innovate and create a change and meet a brand new market need. 
And the question that we have to ask ourselves, can you implement cardboard desks if you need to? Does it make sense to do so? And this is my claim that EA, Enterprise Architecture, aims to be able to do that, to implement the cardboard desk, not literally, of course. Because when we're working from anywhere, what happens is, as I mentioned, I am at a standing desk. I have colleagues who are maybe forced to work from uh, the, the aforementioned bed with the ironing board on it. So the physical requirements are no longer necessarily dictated by corporate policy, but must be dictated by individual needs because different people have different needs. And this sounds maybe like something that you don't really want to get into. Why would we have to uh, give people such a variety of different uh, hardware? Would I have an employee who needs a high-tech microphone and multiple monitors? Well, to an extent, we already do this. Um, we've all we're probably all in organizations right now where we say, well, this is what you get when it comes to hardware and software, except because I will get this computer, I will get this mouse, except if I have an arm injury, then I can get a mouse trapper, or except if I have bad eyes, I can get a bigger monitor, or except if I work in manufacturing, I can get a specific mobile device. So we already consider the individuals but we need to do that more if we want to work from anywhere going forward. So the new credo should probably be, well, you as the individual will be allowed to pick whatever works for you. And the way we can do that is to create a safe approved architecture within hardware and software and whatever other physical or, or uh, virtual uh, efforts that we're responsible for as an EA and then give options to people. And this is what EA has been asked to do and tasked to do by corporations, by the companies that we work in since forever. So this is basically nothing new. It's just a changed scope. So how do we then solve remote working for the team? Well, as corporations or companies, we discovered that there were a lot of things that we were not able to do when COVID-19 hit. We had to scale up. We had to do a variety of different things. Um, an example of someone else who experienced this were schools. Schools were suddenly faced with a very specific set of problems that are also similar to the problems that we're facing. These problems were, well, how can we coordinate? We already have the schedule, the schedule doesn't change, but how can we coordinate things like group work or maybe homework or helping specific students, things like that? How do we communicate? How do we socialize? Because obviously this is something that kids do a lot of, the rest of us do too, but apparently for a majority of reasons, it's not as important to us. And how can we manage these classrooms? And they did this by creating virtual representations of physical interactions. They would use the screenshot shown here, Discord, a piece of software called Discord, and they would create the rooms the same way they would create the classes, the classrooms. They would create rooms for having time off. And they would allow the kids to still have audio, video, and textual interactions. Similar, I mean, this is almost the same as what Teams does, but there are a couple of differences between how Discord does it and how Teams does it, or how Zoom does it, for instance. One of the most notable ones is the socializing aspect. In Discord, you can keep a room open even when no one is in it, and when someone goes into a room, other people can see they're present. So you can create a classroom, or you can create a, a couch area, or a coffee machine, as it were. And you could meet at the coffee machine and you can socialize if that's the case. They obviously are allowed for a sharing of information in real time and asynchronous, basically the same as we see in other applications, Zoom, uh, Teams, uh, all of these things as well, because you can write files, you can share files, and you can have voice communications the same way you do an app. So what they did was, what's interesting about this is they used Discord. Discord is a solution developed for gaming specifically. Um, and this meant that these kids, in most cases, already had it. They already knew the software. 
They just started to use it for school purposes. So they repurposed existing solution within their organization for a new purpose. They also implemented hardware that they already owned, right? This is basically bring your own device because as you can see on my head, a lot of us already have headsets that we use for a variety of different purposes. So we, they use that for the solution. So basically the school looking at it from a company view the users expanded the use of their existing tools in their existing architecture to improve their ways of working, which is what EA does. And that's the point that I'm trying to make is EA does this. This is what EA should do at all times. You define an architecture of hardware and software, which enables the team and the individual to perform at their peak performance gives them the flexibility to do their job in the best possible way. We look for innovation, we should look for innovation, and maybe especially we should look in places outside of our own environment. Maybe we should look to EVE Online. Maybe we should talk to the Icelandic company that somehow managed to have a server with 7,000 people performing combat in the same instance, when maybe the rest of us are having a hard time scaling a meeting with five, 10 people. So innovation, find it elsewhere as well as in your own, but also look elsewhere. And even though you look for innovation, always look at your own backyard first. Maybe we have something we can expand upon. We probably do. And then make the right way, the easy way for the users. When we have solved for a problem, when we have a solution, or if we have a solution ready for a new problem, make sure that that's the easiest way we can implement that going forward. And then harden your architecture for flexibility and agility. All the speakers before me have clearly shown that this is something that's not only doable, um, but has been done. Um, so I don't have to beat down that. Um, point anymore. And a couple of final thoughts then on this. Why, not, why, why do we have to continue focusing on remote working? Why do we have to focus on working from anywhere when uh, my esteemed colleague Kishore just showed us uh, how important it was to create new architectures for returning to work? Well, my, while I agree with everything he said, and I was very impressed by what, it, what I saw, I would suggest that this is EA's time to shine. It is our time to show that our, the companies that we work for can do something great from something obviously not so great. And a couple of thoughts. What human resources can your company attract if you have a work from anywhere policy? How will that affect the people that are willing to apply to your company? Maybe if they don't have to relocate or they can relocate to somewhere they want to relocate and still work for your company. How hard would it actually be to be more flexible with regards to workstations, uh, work hours, work zones, uh, software solutions than we already do? We probably spend a lot of time, all of us, trying to accommodate different uh, parts of the organization. How could it change your corporate image that you can Im include employees working from home as part of your CO2 neutral efforts? I can't remember the number, but I looked up how many people, what the average transport is uh, in the EU, and I believe it's 38 minutes of commute daily, and there are what, 30 million people or 300 million people in the EU? That's a lot of fuel that's being burned just going to and from work. What can that do to our image to alleviate that? How could it change your corporate image if you support the growth of rural areas by allowing a work from anywhere policy? I know this is in a focus in the Danish uh, uh, government, uh, where I'm from, and in Denmark, to grow rural areas to move government offices out. Well, why move them out if they can work from anywhere? And finally, how will it change your EA image when you're specifically working on driving these goals forward for your company? That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Klaus, and uh, great presentation. And uh, we've had some uh, questions coming in.
during the talk. So I'd like to uh, ask you the first question. Um, so EA is is seen in uh, my company, not not my company, but the company of the questioner, as the uh, the philosophers, the thinking team, those those who take their time in analysing, strategising, uh, without real connection to to the real world and um what would what would be the biggest lesson learned from this whole situation uh to, to eas everywhere you know regardless of of their industry uh the biggest lesson learned to ea or to the business as a whole well i'll answer both actually why the hell not um the the, the i think the biz biggest lesson to business is that ea and it is not supplying hardware and supplying power to um, specific solutions. We're actually driving business results because the, the, the heightened awareness of digitalization as uh, an overarching component of business has been driven by EA and IT uh, in the past few months. So I think that's been the biggest, um, let's say, learning for both business and IT. We, IT EA has seen that we can help drive business very directly and business has seen us do it. Okay, thank you. Um, and you talked a lot about innovation and, and taking inspiration from uh, different areas and, and uh, from, from maybe unexpected areas. And it, it's often a challenge to, to harness innovation in, in large organizations. And um, what are the, the biggest challenges uh, to really harness innovation and, and how can EA really help with, with addressing that? Uh, you fill out a bit, you're saying what are the biggest challenges to harness innovation? Yes, and, and, and how can uh, EAs uh, help with that? Um, I think first and foremost, uh, EA needs to focus on or continue to focus on getting uh, the, the uh, business to frame their requirements, their needs as a problem to be solved rather as a solution to be delivered. Um, because that allows EA to supply um, an innovative solution and look at that solution and offer that. I think I, I use this all the time and everyone has seen this before. Uh, that is Henry Ford's famous quote. If I had given the customer what the customer wanted, I would have given them a faster horse. And I think this is this continues to be true and maybe is even more true as we get more and more solutions to problems is if if business continues to say we would like an Excel sheet to solve this problem, then they will be given an Excel sheet. But if we can help them to phrase the question, we need to automate a specific process, then we can look at entirely new ways that they had not expected and we can over prefer, we can overachieve on their requirements. So maybe to, to elaborate uh, on that point, um, do, does that, what what are the typical uh, you know tools of the trade uh, that, that enterprise architects can use to to drive those conversations? And also, you know, does it speak to a need for uh, increased uh, soft skills and, and communication skills? Uh, well, the latter part definitely. I think I think um, at least something like 80% of being an enterprise architect is a question of being able to communicate, both listen and, and to speak uh, to all the different stakeholders that we have. Uh, tools of the trade, obviously an EA tool, like business design, obviously, um, but I, I would say pretty much any enterprise tool that allows you to visualize and connect the different elements of the business is probably the most difficult thing to build. I think everyone here who is, who is a panelist today and probably some of the people uh, watching will agree that um, the tool is not the solution and it's very difficult to get the data into the tool. But once you have that, when you hit, let's call it critical mass of information and starts delivering to business 
uh, information or view and insight and wisdom that they did not see beforehand. And you can deliver that, uh, let's say, um, uh, I was about to say unprovoked without having asked for it and say, look guys, this is what, this is going to be your problem six months down the road. That's when we really deliver as EA. Thank you. Um, so another question we have coming in, um, what are the key uh, technology or adoption challenges in, in, in using these you know, new cutting edge, edge solutions? Is it you know, primarily the security aspects, the training aspects, you know, people aspects? I, I would say primarily security. Um, I think security drives pretty much everything when it comes to new technology. And I think it should. I think, unfortunately, the humans being humans, uh, we will also always have enormous threats and, and they just keep growing. So security is probably the main one. Um, second one, uh, I would say training, but I would like to say that that should be the last one because that comes back to, I believe that we should select tools that allow us to use them in such a way that they're easy to adopt. And if we use, like I said, uh, uh, as part of my, my talk, if we use an existing tool in new ways, we don't have to teach. We don't have to show new ways of doing it. It, it will come automatically. People will understand it, right? So, which is why some things, it's like, that is the reason Excel is used for everything, including as an EA tool, because everyone understands Excel. Everyone knows what the buttons do. Everyone can do a calculation in Excel. And that's why people say, well, it's the best tool for everything, which it isn't, but it's understandable why they do that. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Klaus. And with that, um, we're going to move to a 15 minute break.